Welcome to Beyond the Press Release, a production of Gorecom, in which we take the time to speak with small cap executives after they put out important news. With us today, happy to have her back, Joanne Free. She's president and CEO of Candente Copper Trades under the stock symbol DNT in Canada. For those who are new to the story uh, and you're seeing some great numbers for copper out there, some great things going on in the copper space, well, Candente owns a large economic copper deposit in Peru. Uh, it's at feasibility stage. Uh, and right now, 7.5 billion pounds measured and indicated and can be mined for 22 years once in production. Uh, once in production, it's in the lowest quartile of production costs for projects waiting to be developed under a dollar per pound. And it's capable of generating annual production of 262,000 pounds of copper. None of these are typos, these are numbers. 262,000 pounds of copper, 39,000 ounces of gold, 911,000 ounces of silver, over initial mine life of 22 years. Uh, that's why Goldman Sachs has the project listed as one of the top 10 in the world waiting to be developed uh, and is number 42 in South America. Joanne, welcome back. Thanks very much, George. Uh, what, we're ta- what we're talking about today is that you've conducted a study to identify and define perhaps uh, a different option, a smaller, higher grade startup option uh, with a smaller initial capex and accelerated payback period. You're just getting options. You can do it. You can go full blast, I'm sure, but you're trying to get options. What were the results of the study? Yeah, thanks very much, George, for that <clears throat> questions. Um, so w- when we developed our 2011 studies, Everybody was selling projects like ours for 400, 600, maybe even $800 million. Of course, we were in a big hurry to do, you know, to prove that we were very similar to those projects. And Kanyarako um, Norte is. And we used 250 copper in our all our studies. So we were very conservative. Now, what we decided to do, and, and along the years we thought would be very beneficial to the project, is to see if we couldn't start smaller with a smaller cop, capex. What, when we finally embarked on this with Asenko, in addition to having a smaller capex or looking for a smaller capex, we, I, all, I and the team also said, what else can we do to, to have another option of how to build this and potentially improve the ESG, environmental social governance aspects of the project? It's not just about making money or saving money. It's also about you know, building, building things the right way right. Um, for the world, for the community, for everybody. So, and and a lot of things have changed in the last 10 years. So the first thing I wanted to do was look at the roaster because we had a roaster built into our our 2011, which was, um, we we did pre-feasibility, but we stopped at a, before we quite finished pre-feasibility. So it's called a, it's a pre-feasibility study progress report is where we got to on that. The roaster was to take care of all the arsenic and Cadelco was in, in, in the middle of building that for, for mines of theirs in Chile. They since built it and it's very effective and it's not that costly. But what we discovered in all our discussions about the arsenic is that Cadelco had 4% arsenic. We had less than one and a half, have less than one and a half percent arsenic throughout the deposit. And what's the so, implication of that? Well, it's, it's just, you, you want to get your arsenic out of the, out of the copper to sell it, or it needs to get out of the copper someday before the copper gets used. So whether you blend it with mineralization that has no arsenic or whether you treat it with a roaster or whether you, you let other people blend it and you pay a penalty, there's many options of getting it down there. But the point is that what we, what we realized is that we really didn't have a level of arsenic that warranted the roaster. And as I say, the roasters tried and true technology, environmentally friendly because it puts the arsenic out as a inert, hard mineral, scorodite that you just, you know, stays stable when, when you take it out. Um, so in any case, that was our first approach. And what Asenko came and said is, let's do a geometallurgical model. And this had never been done before in our ore deposit or our, our deposit. So what they did is they took a look at every, every they realized every rock type has a different has a different level of arsenic in it then in addition to that every rock type the arsenic in that reports to the con differently which was a surprise so in our 2011 work we thought that the arsenic in the ore body was was um through 88 uh, percent of what arsenic was there would report to the concentrate 
we discovered that overall it was less is around 60 65 but in addition to that there's many portions of the ore body that even if it has some arsenic it'll report very little of that will end up in the con so it just stays in the waste is the point so that's a, that's that's actually a good thing then yeah because people don't very know good at home right yeah so and and then you combine that with with starting to look at this as a smaller project you can say okay i'm going to put two shovels in the pit instead of trying to move too much rock at once you can start being selective and so we did the, what the guys did, gals did, is um, the geometallurgical model allowed an NSR model, which also took into account where you would pay penalties for the arsenic. And so with the idea of two shovels, you can grab from one part of the pit where it's high copper with no arsenic, and then another part where there is some arsenic, but combined, it won't meet, it won't need to pay penalties or we do pay penalties in certain portions just to get it so that's an interesting way of of i'm going to call it high grading your deposit or selectively mining to make it a, a a higher nsr and that's what they did and because of all that we don't need the roaster so and that, that that makes it even more economical than you thought back in it, exactly the roaster was 15 to 20 percent of our capex so when it was wow. 1.56 it was uh, over 150 well 150 million um even if you add today's costs up up uh, you know probably about 25 30 percent increase on that it's it would be the same it's also like i keep saying it's a technology tried and true there's nothing wrong with it but it's another operational um activity so if you take that out it just saves on your op costs and saves yeah. smooths out your whole operation and i do believe also just esg it's seen as much more friendly so we take that out that was our first component then we figure out that yes we can we can we did throughputs of 40,000 ton per day 50,000 ton per day 60,000 ton per day and they all looked like they could be economic until I do a PEA I can't say what's economic and any kind of numbers but the interesting thing about that is so compare when in 2011 we were running it at 95,000 tons per day that gave the copper you suggested or you said that was estimated 260 million pounds or 118,000 tons of copper a year. So I can't give you the exact numbers, but you can do the math. So you go to 40, you're a little less than half of that. You go to 50, you're pretty much half of that, right? right? And so then we, further to that, we, we and Asenko said, okay, what if we start at the, you know, the lowest, uh, lowest capex that it'll be, for, which would be 40,000 ton per day. And then we, we, we run at that for, for however many years it takes payback, which at certain levels of copper look, would be four years probably. And again, can't say that, have to do it in the PA, but that's what the, the idea is. Well, then you've got cash flow from your mind to expand. So you can end up with an operation that is near that 95,000 tons per day, or even is that 95,000 tons per day. The simplest would be to start at 40,000 and ramp up to 80, because that's just a double. It's the old but, adage of how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time. So it's <laughs> trying to tackle uh, kind of echo all in one shot. It just seems smarter to kind of take little bites, bigger bites, bigger bites, and just keep working exactly. your way up. Exactly. And then the last component that we've been looking at is what to, is tailings. Can we, can we pr improve upon that? And now this would not be a cost saving. It would actually cost a little bit more money, but it's environmentally and, and easy, stronger, you know, better. And, and also just um, has a smaller, could have a smaller footprint if we don't use wet tailings. So dry, ta dry stack tailings is where the industry is going. Everybody is moving towards that. Um, wet stack tailings need to be contained with a big dam and they're more fluid. So it's a little, takes up more space and it can be, that's, that's where you get your tailing dam failures and, and some instances that you know are not good. So that's the other thing we wanna look at. And we, are, we have been looking at it and, so the desktop study did say it, it, it is potentially viable, but we have to do further work on that. Excuse my telephone is on here. That's okay. Um, That's, hey, you, so. we're glad that you're getting phone calls. You're getting, <laughs> things are means things are busy. All our phones should be ringing. So, yeah. so Joanne, before we move on to um, the expectations for the PEA, because it sounds like it sounds like you've you've got a pretty good idea, and now yeah. it just needs to be confirmed by the by the by the PEA. Um, if everything goes you know, if, if, if everything works out and we'll talk about the expectation for the PA, but if everything was to work out, how soon until you could start uh, going into, you know, production at a smaller level, just at the bite size, as you're saying, keep moving your way up. 
Well, the, the PEA is preliminary economic assessment and your, your normal engineering route is then you do a pre-fees on this, this new project. Um, and then you would do feasibility and then you would do, you know, get all your permits and do construction. Now, because we've done so many studies, it's been suggested there's a, there's a good chance we could go from PEA into feasibility. And, and skip doing another or, or all those extra studies that you'd call pre-fees. But I can't say that for sure yet. That depends on how, how clear things seem to be from the PEA. But if the PEA, we're thinking three to four months for, for the results from the PEA, we should be launching it next week, I think, I'm hoping, um, then, um, then feasibility would probably be another six months after that. And then, but you do need EIA study, so I really can't say on the timeline there. Normal EIA takes takes minimum one year because you need your wet seasons and your dry seasons. Right. But because we have just we're just completing an EIA semi detailed, which is for drilling permits, maybe that can all get combined. I really I don't well, know. There are a lot of things that could overlap. And and there's, you won't then there's as we know permitting and and working with communities and all that stuff. So it all takes time. I don't I wouldn't want to imply a timeline to production yeah and, that's, but, and by the way that's a great answer because it gives everyone at home okay so you talk about four months and then six months uh and, and just and there might be some overlapping things that get done concurrently or you may have to do a little more extra work after that question yeah. for you do you is your is your primary objective to put uh the, the to put it into production or do you want to go through the pea and feasibility study at that point You've got all the economics laid out as one big capex or bite-sized capex is an increasing in size and then go to the market and sell it you sell a project when the timing's right you don't sit still and say okay it's time to sell so we want to keep we want to keep moving this project ahead as fast and as well as possible and and either get built or get bought out at the right price having said all that you know, I'll talk about the permutations we've had on the project. So initially we thought we could start with an SXEW plant, which was mm -hmm. CapEx was supposed to be in, 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 the, in the PEA in 2007, 140 million. Well, we had a, a partner came in and we were gonna do that ourselves. Now the leach technology or leaching testing work didn't pan out and then we moved to flotation and we got a much bigger CapEx. Copper was in a boom and lots of people were talking about financing us on attractive debt and such. And we did talk about being able to build it ourselves. Once the CapEx came out and it was 1.6 billion, um, then then it was, okay, that's way too big. And and certain people that sure. you know, were interested backed off. So then we gave up the idea of building it ourselves and it's just, let's do what all my friends did and sell it for four to six to $800 million. And we did have, as we as we've discussed before, a market cap of 250 million in 2011-12. Now, one thing that's new for me or more recent is that once we started talking about having this lower capex it has been brought up to me again that the peruvian pension funds could be interested in in actually putting up half of the capex if it's the right price for them and i really don't want to name exact prices of course um, no no we, but, we would not want to give you but, we not want to where your bargains and, are but then um that would be very attractive debt financing. In addition to that, people have approached us recently from German smelters who are supported by German state banks, who, if we had offtake agreements with or such, would also have attractive debt financing. So when you get your capex significantly lower, you know a lot. It can, it can change the world. It opens up and like it's like typical real estate. If a home is selling for five million dollars, only there's a small amount of people that can actually that are even possible but could buy it. If yeah. you can bring it down to two and a half million dollars for bite size, then it opens up a five times bigger potential. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. How much of that has to do with the fact there must be two things in play there, right, Joanne? One is the world is starving for yield. Uh, traditional debt uh, is not getting, you know, the 10 year treasury, I think in the US is 1.2%. Uh, yeah. So money, uh, like you're saying, the Peru Peruvian pensions and, you know, funds in Germany are probably. And the second thing is copper being at, you know, four. You know, four fifty now. Uh, so it, that must be very attractive. Thirty today will be be conservative, more conservative. Here. Pardon me? <laughs> it's only at four thirty today, I think. Oh, okay. I just round up <laughs> four fifty. <laughs> but but having said that, are those two things in play? Are those the two factors that the world is starving for yield 
pensions, funds, or stuff. And and this makes it even more attractive. That, that makes makes uh, Canada Act even more attractive. Yep, absolutely. Uh, and it's interesting that you brought up the you know Peruvian fund, but I because I didn't realize the Peruvian pensions. Uh, I didn't realize that those were even potentially in play, which is great. Player, yeah. um, what is the state of you know, most companies we talk to are in British Columbia or so? Just for everyone at home, maybe watching the first time, what is the status of? the uh the political scene in peru and how mining friendly is it uh, and how much help or hindrance could they be to to you yeah thank you for that very important today they're inaugurating a new president today today El <laughs> and, <President Day>. <laughs> and, um, so they had a they're they held an election recently obviously um and the two candidates one was far right and one was far left um, of course, they started with 18 candidates and, and then they had to choose out of the 18, the top two, which is, is a very awkward way to have an election, I would say. Um, but in any case, the candidate that won by about 40,000 votes only in a, in a country that's 30 million voters, um, he, he, he started off, he's saying, you know, nationalizing minds and, and very socialistic, communistic um, ideas. But today he is, or I don't know about the inauguration right now, but coming up to today, he's moderated ex extremely um, to that. And so he, his chief financial um, economist advisor um, advised more, at least uh, two or three weeks ago that they understand there, there's no, no discussion of nationalizing mines and, and such. They understand that mining companies need to make profits. Now they will look at their taxes and see if it makes sense to make some adjustments there, especially something related to your profit. So they've had that already, but they might change that. Um, now, because it was such a close election, Congress is actually controlled by the opposition. So again, that there was discussion of changing the constitution. Well, they'll only be doing that now piecemeal. So discussion, should we change this piece? Should we change this part? And, and that's okay. That's a healthy way to improve your the way your com country operates. Yeah, because that so, means no extremes are taking place. So everyone's exactly. got to play ball together. Yeah. So the feeling is now there's going to be a lot of negotiations going on as to what's better for the country. And there, there, COVID really hit Peru hard. And of course, who, who got affected mostly more by COVID than anybody? The poor people. And there have been a lot of inequalities in Peru, and they've been having a challenge of sharing the wealth. So that needs to happen. That's good for us, because then people can understand what they benefit from development, if they, in fact, <clears throat> do benefit from a mine in their backyard, but also understanding their government has all the, the same environmental controls that the rest of the world has and such. So um, it's been very rocky for investors wondering what's going to happen but i think we're coming to a much more um confident place now all right good good to know because and i'm glad you clarified that because there are a lot of nuances there that you know uh you wouldn't know just from trying to read a headline no and and there's so much in there's and, and mining is the economy of growth for peru i mean it really yeah. is their way out of sure. the horrible situation they're in now not not only because of all the health and deaths and such but the economy, I mean, as we all know throughout the world, economies have been ravaged by COVID and Peru is, is one of the worst. And the way you, if you're, if you're a new, if you're a new president, the way you keep people happy is get them jobs as fast as possible. So, okay, yeah. great to know. And we'll check in on that uh, as time goes on. Switching gears a little bit from Peru, because, you know, uh, obviously for anyone who's been following Candente, Canadiaco has been obviously the flagship and still is. Uh, but you did uh, make a new Canadian acquisition. You've got an option yeah. agreement to acquire up to 100% interest in the Canyon Creek copper project in British Columbia. Correct. Um, just quickly, and we'll, we'll, we'll get more detail uh, on the next one, but what was, the, what was the thinking behind? I like the fact that you stayed with copper. What was the thinking uh, behind the, the, uh, the acquisition? Well, when copper's at four, over $4 a pound and, and there's no end in sight of, of strong prices for a long time, what do, what do we want in our portfolio? More copper. And I'm an exploration geologist. We've often had in our portfolio in, in Candente of several, several projects. 
We now only own two other projects in Peru, two other porphyries. One is partnered out, one we're in some discussions on. So I thought, well, we should be looking for more. Then, of course, there's always good to have geopolitical, re de you know, de-risking. And um, the owner of, of Canyon Creek had approached me a while ago and we kept talking and I kept looking at the data. And I had done um, porphyry evaluations for Placer Dome um, before I started Candente. And so I'm very familiar with a lot of BC geology. Some of it I've forgotten or a lot of it I've forgotten. But in any case, this property has a million dollars already spent on it. It's very typical of many discoveries. It was actually discovered in the 70s by Naranda and Asarco and some other big companies. And um, so we, we know there's copper mineralization in outcrop on the property. There's huge soil anomalies, which is really indicative of a large deposit. And they're both copper and moly. And so, and then some great geophysical um, in, indicators too of, of large systems and typical, typical porphyries. So it has all the markers. Now, obviously I can't promise that it's going to be, it is, ec would, will, will be of a porphyry course. and will be economic, but, but it's great. It's a, it's a fantastic exploration opportunity and it just adds to our copper base. And I think what's really impressive is this, it's easy to pick up uh, projects when the market's suppressed, you know, if copper's at $2 a pound, nobody wants them. Yeah. So it's easy, but with copper at 430, so we're precise, um, there's gotta be a lot of competition out there for projects like Canyon Creek. So what does that say about the fact that you guys were able to, uh, to, to win it? Yeah, the property owner, Chris Baldis, um, has known me for a long time. We've known each other and, um, he approached me and said he felt we'd do the right thing with his project and he wanted our shares. He didn't want a lot of cash and he wants the work done in the right way. And um, so it's, it's, it's credence to our, our company, credibility, yeah. Yeah, I think that's great third party validation. Plus, yeah. I think that also speaks to, because look, he doesn't want to, he doesn't, uh, the, Chris was name, I'm sure he doesn't want to, doesn't want to be paid in George bucks. So he's not gonna <laughs> have any value in the future. So clearly he's also by inference, and I, I'm not putting words in his mouth, but you know, from the outside, the inference is the implication is uh, he's comfortable getting Candente uh, shares at these levels because he sees nice upside for him. It's yeah, not, upside on his project, upside on what we're doing in Peru, which he's, he's got a double, double edged sword level. there. I mean, I'm sorry, not double, double dip there for him. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Joanne, thanks for joining us. I'm going to leave last words to you. What should uh, shareholders of Candente be looking for next? And and how do you feel about the rest of 2021? Very exciting. So the, how, the results of the PEA will be, as I say, three to four months um, and really, really open up the door for this project, for Kanyariaco and, and what, what can be there. So, And then we're also working on drill permits for Kanyariaco Sur and Quebrada Verde, where we think we have a lot more copper and uh, working on community agreements and such. Well, hopefully in three, four months, that puts us just before Christmas. So maybe it can be an early Christmas present from you yes, and for you. Absolutely. And, and looking forward to that. But thanks for joining yeah. us today. Congratulations on continuing to do great things with the project, make it more and more valuable, more and more attractive. And, uh, you know, we're, we're, in that, we're in that great spot now. It's going to be a really exciting time to be following Candente. Thank you very much. For everybody home, you've been watching or you've been listening by podcast on Spotify, Google, Apple, your favorite podcast platform to Joanne Fries. She's present CEO of Candente Copper, trades in the stock symbol DNT. For those of you new to the store, you want to start your due diligence. Two ways to do it. First, get over the Candente profile on the Gorecom, where because we know sometimes you know, geology has a lot of details and, and a lot of terms that people don't investors don't always understand. We've given you a really good overview, layman's overview of the company. And it's obviously its flagship Canadiaco uh, uh, project. Then head over, you can see it right above Joanne there, CondenteCopper.com to do your deep dive due diligence. Copper's bullish, the price shows it. Demand for copper isn't going to abate. It's only gonna be increasing over time. So all the factors are in the right place. You gotta do your due diligence. Just don't say we didn't tell you so. Have a great day. See you next time. Hey guys, this video is over, but don't forget to help your company by liking it and even leaving a comment below. And then don't forget to help yourself by subscribing to our channel and never missing another great Agoracom small cap video.